Thank you so much. And I think our wonderful speaker is going to come up in just a minute. Um, but I got to say, when I was asked to uh, come and be with you all today, to step in, some of you may know there was meant to be another moderator on today. Uh, I was thrilled, right? And actually, I didn't step into it. I leaped into it because I am a massive, massive fan of the work of Make My Money Matter. And I think this is one of the most exciting conversations we can have. Now, I am going to go out on a limb, and I know it's really gutsy to do that, but I'm feeling the energy in the room as well, Karen. And I'm going to say with confidence that at the end of the hour we are together, I'm hoping you are going to be just as excited about pensions as I am. Okay? Woo. Yes. Woo. I like the woo energy. And, and I actually have that confidence because we are joined by two amazing speakers who are going to help bring this idea to life, this important theme to life, through their own reflections and their mass amount of experience and insight. Um, and they're also going to sort of share the stories of what this looks like when we can truly start looking at pensions as being a tool, not just for the change in our businesses, but a change in the system that we all know needs to happen. Now, before we bring the two speakers up, though, I want to also mention two words that are in the air right now. And those two words are change and service. And I think we can all acknowledge that we are in a time right now of profound change. And I think we can also reflect on the importance of service. Service for others, service for organizations, and service for causes. So over our hour together, I would love for you to hold those two words close and to remember actually that we have the power to be the change through how we choose to be in service. And there is a great quote that I think many of us all know, which is, we can be the change, right? So as we go through this, I want you to all really be thinking about your own power and how you think about this moment that really matters, the power you have to be in service in this time of change. Now, two people who are absolutely a being the change Deborah Meaden, um, who I'm going to actually have both of you guys come up probably, if that's okay. Why don't we have you guys both come up? Yeah, thank you. It's a out. So, Deborah Meaden is someone who is known to all of us, right? Right? Business guru. Um, I'm not sure if this is a verb, but I'm going to make it up as a verb. Dragoning, you know, you're, we, we all know how you dragon your way through with Dragon's Den. Um, and also your incredible show you w do with BBC, which I know we're going to be hearing more about, um, Big Green Money, the Big Green Money show. And I think what's so interesting about Big Green Money is you're really looking at ways in which, you know, businesses can have impact on the planet. And I love that you bring this idea of what's the opportunity, like how can we view sustainability in business as an opportunity? So super excited to hear from you, Deborah. And I'm going to share just a little personal story of how and why I think you are just truly legendary because sometimes things happen and you gotta take a stand, right? And I was blown over and just super impressed when you took a stand here in the UK opposing the police and crime bill. And if those of you who aren't familiar about this, I just encourage you to take a look at it and definitely look up Deborah's article she wrote on it. So thank you for everything that you do and what you take a stand on, Deborah. Um, and then we're also joined by Richard Curtis. I feel like how to go through the order of all the wonderful things you've done, Richard, is always tricky, but I think co-founder of Make My Money Matter, which is what we're here together to talk about, pensions and the power of pensions, co-founder of Comic Relief, SDG, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Ambassador, and I'd like you to know I'm wearing my pin. I always have it on. Uh, and oh, I think a filmmaker as well, right? Done, done, a, done a few films here and there, so. so. Yeah. Um, I was going to make a Love Actually joke as well, but I'm going to leave that because we've already heard one Love Actually joke. So maybe we'll have time for a few more over the course of the evening. Um, but the personal story I'd love to share about how we haven't known each other for very long, Richard, but during um, the pandemic, I think we were on a Zoom call together and it was like a pension event we were doing with the B Corp movement. And do you remember we said we were going to do a playlist, a pension playlist? And this just sort of speaks to the vibe, right? he can do like a pension party and actually have a playlist that comes out of it. And I'm going to reveal 
what your song choice was or your artist of choice that you put on that playlist. I don't know if you remember. But at that time, you were really listening to Kanye. Like, that was your, yeah, that was your music of, of, of the time. So, I mean, do you want, is there any other music you're listening to right now? I feel like maybe we need to create a playlist for tonight. Um, very little Kanye that has to be said. <laughs> I mean, I'd suggest everyone listen to James Blake's new album, but that's just a, that's just a private thing. There we go, James Blake. I, I will actually suggest that when we start taking questions from all of you, I want to be hearing what kind of music you're all listening to, so maybe we can create a little playlist for tonight. Actually, Deborah, I'd be interested in what music you're listening to. Well, I was thinking of a very appropriate one, um, which I can't remember now. Oh, okay, well, we'll come back to you. We'll come back. No, we'll come back. no, no. I've got it. Money's too tight to mention. Oh, yeah. You but so... not the Simply Red one, the original one, the Valentine Brothers. Okay, we, we definitely need to be making notes of these songs, and I hope all of you are thinking already, because I might actually just start cold calling people and finding out what playlist. Actually, no, I take that back, because we have a very important power hour together to make sure that you all leave this room excited about the power of pension funds. Um, okay, so just to orient yourselves to how we're going to spend the remaining time together, we're going to hear from these two incredible speakers. It's going to fire you all up, get you all excited. I'm going to take hostess permission, I don't know if that's a thing, but I'm going to take it, to ask a few questions of myself to each of you. Um, but then we're going to turn it over to you all. So again, in addition to thinking of your song for the playlist, let's hear if you can come up some really tricky, tricky good questions, okay? Got to make sure we, uh, we get the most out of these two incredible speakers so that you all have this sort of sense of fire and energy when it comes to addressing the challenges we're facing through our pensions. Okay, any questions from anyone? Anyone want to like sort of stop us now and say, actually, I thought I was here to hear about something else? No? Okay. Then I think we're good to go. Richard, why don't I kick it off with you? I'm going to actually come around to the side here. I'm oh, oh, there we go. It's because it's, it's so hot in here, right? I mean, I feel like the energy is just setting everything uh, on edge. Okay, so Richard, we're going to start with you. Now, billions, right? With a B, let's just be clear, not with an M. Billions of dollars with pension funds, companies have the opportunity to really find ways of turbocharging their sustainability goals rather than undermining them by, again, harnessing the power of pensions. Um, love to hear you talk a little bit about why you think pensions are so important. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, you know, a great shock to me that I should be here talking about this issue because uh, I definitely hadn't thought about my pension you know, until about four years ago, I knew I had it. I think, in fact, my dad made me organize it. And, you know, my dream about tonight is that all of you would just go away thinking, well, that is an extraordinary lever for action that I didn't know was there. And if you have known that it was there, that you would just act even more enthusiastically about it. So what I thought I'd do to start with is just kind of whip you through how I come to be here because I originally started Comic Relief in 1986, Red Nose Day, and very much about development and very much about, as it were, public fundraising, asking the public to give their money. That was my priority for kind of 15, 20 years. And then uh, I suppose the next, the sort of biggest shift then was when we did the Live Aid concerts and the Make Poverty History campaign, and that was a debt trade aid campaign. I remember, quite interestingly, that it was meant to include climate, and then we decided that it was too complicated to include climate, which interesting now. Um, and I do remember then, one of the kind of things I remember is trying to interest business in these issues, and I remember a really bizarre meeting in the Groucho Club with nine angry men in suits and ties, and they were all men, and they looked at us as though we were, you know, card-carrying communists and said, well, this has literally got nothing to do with us. And that was my sort of sense of business, that I'm not going to be working with them, I'm going to be trying to bend them. Then I got interested in the Sustainable Development Goals, because I've been working in a way for the Millennium Development Goals all my life, and I thought, well, here they come. And what I was trying to do was find a way of making them kind of more attractive, making them famous, giving them graphics, you know, calling them the global goals and everything. And what was interesting then was that climate came in there. And I thought, well, 
because the goals are about injustice, development, climate, all the kind of interconnection between all of them. And I suddenly thought, well, I better, it doesn't make any sense any longer for me not to realize that climate has a huge amount to do with the poverty issues that I've always been passionate about. And it was such a huge issue, um, particularly for my kids when we talked about it um, during lockdown. It was, you know, the three issues were diversity and justice, gender equality, I mean, we weren't talking about Love Island, obviously that was number one, but, um, you know, and climate. And what, all the time that I was making films for the UN, we kept saying in the films, we have to turn the billions into trillions. And I had no idea how that was to be done. We would say it because that seemed to be the truth, but I remember all the campaigning around Make Poverty History, and I think sort of at the top mark, it sort of freed up about 45 mil billion for development, and that's not trillions. And so the reason I'm doing the pension campaign is because I had an absolutely sort of road to Damascus moment. I was watching a, a, you know, a TED talk with a woman called Bronwyn King, and she said in her TED talk, she'd been a cancer doctor and she had her first meeting with her accountant when she was 35, as it were, and said, where's my money invested? And it emerged that three of the, the, three of the top six things she was invested in were tobacco companies. So she suddenly realized that actually, through her investment, she had been taking more lives than she had been saving by working every day of her life to help cancer patients. And I suddenly thought, where is my money? And, and somewhere around there, I was in conversation and we found, and I found out that the world pension market is something like, Tony, is it 47, 60 trillion dollars in pensions? And I don't think I even knew that pension money was invested. I think it sort of sat in Gringotts and then you got a bit extra uh, when you took it out at the end. Uh, and the UK, I think it's 3.1 trillion or something like that, pounds. So suddenly, here were the trillions. You know, here were the trillions and the trillions belong to us. Uh, and so it was, a, 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 and I deeply didn't want to take on a new campaign, but this just seemed to me such a major thing and all the texture of conversation that I was having, particularly with my kids, was about what can I actually do? And, and I was always saying, well, give money to relief, that's what you can actually do. But actually I found that the younger generation increasingly saying, well, I, you know, I'm gonna change the way I travel, I'm gonna change the food I buy, I'm gonna change the clothes I buy, I'm gonna check on what companies are doing. And it all, munch together into this sense that if people knew about their pensions, where their pensions were invested, and what a massive sort of structural and cultural change would happen if pensions were reapplied into ethical, sustainable, climate-ready versions of capitalism, that that would make a much, you know, the biggest possible a difference to the world. And I remember I, the first person I spoke to about it was Mark Carney, who I happened to know. And I said, is this like a rogue idea? And he said, this is absolutely an idea that is now. And he said, all the details aren't worked out. The transparency isn't exactly what it should be. But I think you will find that the pension companies are waiting for this if they can hear that the public is passionate about it, cares about it, understands about it, is going to be increasingly aware about it. And then I said, but is it like a kind of luxury? Is this one of those things where it's morals versus money or value versus values? You know, I'll change my pension, I'll make less money. And he said, absolutely not. He said, increasingly it's looking, and this has been even more true, I think, during lockdown, as though the sustainable investments are the ones that have been thriving. And he said, we should be starting to redefine risk, because he said the riskiest thing that can happen to any company is to be found out that they're lying about their sort of moral and sustainable credentials. And that's when a company loses all its value instantly. And companies that are known and understood to be moral, ethical, sustainable, environmentally thinking, getting much better employees because people are expecting their businesses to 
to as it were, stand up for what they think is right. Um, and so it strikes me as being the most extraordinary thing that I've been involved in. And the results are amazing. And during the course of the last few years with the work that the brilliant team of Make My Money Matter have been doing, in alliance with all the other people who are campaigning and thinking about this, is in my whole time at Comet Relief, we've raised 1.6 billion, and I'm profoundly proud of that. But during the two years of Make My Money Matter, 1.3 trillion has been moved into sustainable pension investment. And so all I would just say to all of you is that if you haven't thought about this, really think about it. I, I, I went to a friend of mine who runs a big entertainment company, said, well, you know, will you do me a favor? Will you be one of the people who signs up to say that you're gonna have a sustainable pension? He wrote back to me and said, we've done it. And I said, thank you very much. And he said, actually, no, thank you. Because he said, it's the single most popular thing I've ever done as the boss of my company. Uh, and I would just say to everyone here, you know, look into it. If you run a company, I can't see any reason why any young person joining a company where now compulsorily you have to have a pension would not say, well, can we definitely have a sustainable one? And there's an interesting thing here. Am I at my time almost? Yeah. yeah. It it's an interesting thing that when we first started to talk to the pension companies and to governments. And by the way, this is a really interestingly structured campaign because we've really tried to alert the public to these issues and a lot more people, I mean, Tony will know all and David will know all the percentages, but are aware that pensions are both important and could be uh, a benefit for good. But it really is, you know, we've really got to a position where there could be a major shift uh, in the way that people think about their pensions. And the government were initially sort of worried that we were a divestment campaign, that it was all about getting out of arms, getting out of, of cigarettes, getting out of fossil fuels. And I must admit, I can't see why you wouldn't get out of cigarettes. It just seems to me lunacy uh, that anyone would be investing in that. But there are arguments about fossil fuel, about engagement versus divestment. But for me, the exciting thing is what you could be investing in. I mean, the idea that, I mean, I've actually asked my pension company, I'm investing in green cement. Uh, I'm investing in reverse vending machines, which are things where you put in, as it were, plastic and out comes, uh, you, you actually make money that you can spend on other things. And in affordable housing, in the people who put the oil to make sure that the wind farms turn around. I mean, there are just so many things. And also, I think I thought sustainable investment was all about sort of coffee in Kenya. I think I thought that it was that kind of thing, whereas, in fact, it's massively a thing right across the UK as well with all sorts of businesses and industries here. So, as it were, my general message, if I might say, is crazy not to look at where your pension is unbelievable thought that companies would be doing all this stuff about getting sort of local vegetables in their canteens and not see that this massive amount of money that they're investing often seven times more than they're getting in their own sustainable actions is just hiding in their pensions uh, and so just to everyone you know to yourselves to your business if you run one pensions are the major weapon in the armory of the battle for those things that really matter to the whole world, particularly environmental, particularly net zero. Huge number of companies are signing on to this. And so to me, it's a radical and different kind of campaign and way of looking about how, what you can actually do to change the world. Um, and, and just to end off, I'd like to just show you a little thing here. We're gonna, I hope you can see through the glasses, Deborah and I are gonna move. This actually is a sort of divestment film. But it's just a little film that we made about deforestation. Um, I'm trying to remember the statistics, but something like, I think, 300 billion of UK pension investment goes into deforestation. If deforestation was a country, it would be the third biggest reducer of, I mean, causer of emissions beneath the USA and China. So it's a big issue. You may recognize Jason Isaacs. He wore a white wig in Harry Potter. I'm Guy Byrne Woods, 
CEO of the Forestry Felling Syndicate. On behalf of the global logging industry, I want to thank people like you for collectively investing hundreds of millions with us. Your pension funds, no matter how piddly, all add up. And with all your cash, we've been able to destroy more natural habitat than we ever thought possible. From Alaska to the Amazon, Siberia to Sudan. Synergy. We've also used your investments to fight pesky government restrictions. In fact, every single minute, we managed to clear about 30 football fields of forest. There goes another one. But we can only keep up our record-breaking work with your help. With your continued investment, we can do even more together next year to make money and destroy the planet. So remember, your money is literally changing the world. Thank you. Merry Christmas. There we go. That's the bad side. The other side is really great. There's so much money in it. Move your pension. Move your pensions, friends. Move your pensions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So, number one, I, I think a film about nine angry men in suits, that sounds like something I would certainly watch, you know, just saying. Um, also, just to track millions, billions, trillions. Pop quiz, anyone know how many zeros are on the end of a trillion? Oh, you know. Oh, I can see you're, you're coming for it, right? No? Let me come back to you. Tw close. 12. I think it's 12. I'm looking at Tony, who's the... 12. I think, it's, I think it's 12. So just when you think about these numbers, they can be sort of sometimes abstract when you think of zeros and millions and billions. 12 zeros on the end of it. And if, I mean, you've already said it, I'm going to say it again. If you go to the Make My Money Matter website, there actually are incredibly easy to use tools that you can use as an individual, you can use to engage with your business. So definitely check it out. But now over to Deborah. I mean, Deborah, I've been so excited to hear what your perspective is on pensions and how we can use them as a, a force and a power for good. But I also know you're going to be reflecting on so many of the other things that you see out in the wider business landscape. How is this singing to you? And, and again, I want to come back to hear more about what songs you're listening to as well. But. Um, well, first of all, uh, I'm so pleased. Um, uh, Emma interviewed me for the Big Green Money Show, and um, you know she she put Richard and I together, thinking that they clearly have the same kind of passions. So I cannot tell you how chuffed I am to be talking about what is my favourite topic, which is how do you change the world for the better for everyone and everything, and our fellow creatures that live amongst the world as well. And this is something that I carry around with the businesses that I work with on a regular basis. I never stand in front of anybody as an expert. I am an absolutely not an expert on anything. Um, I hope I, I, I know where to go for experts, um, but I'm a generalist. And I'm a generalist with a good ear and a good nose. I listen a lot and I pay attention to what's going on out there. And I wanted to pick up on, a, on, on, on talking about the things that I'm hearing that really give me hope because it can be really overwhelming, this whole trying to you know, change the way we do business. Um, it, it can feel like we, this is hopeless, we can't do it. And actually, every day I come across inspiration that makes me think, oh, we can, we're amazing, humans can do just about anything. I'm really lucky, and I think it's through my platform of Dragon's Den, that I work with, I've obviously run my own businesses, that's tiny businesses that are growing into big businesses. Um, I invest in small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and, but I also walk amongst the giants in the, in, in, you know, in, of industry. So I get, I think, a really wide perspective on the conversations that's going, because, because I'm known for my sustainability. It's quite difficult to sift out what people are saying to try and please me versus what they're saying because they really, really mean it. But I'll talk about my time in Dragon's Den. I've seen over a th thousand business pictures. When I first started, they called me Swampy. They called me Swampy. Theo, who you know, would sit there and he'd go, there she goes again, on and on and on about the environment. Over the last 10 years, I've seen that change quite slowly. 
But over the last five years, I've seen a massive change in the approach of business towards their, uh, towards their understanding of their planetary impact. So I'm talking about business that either born fundamentally of sustainability and we get far more of those in the den you know and it's usually it isn't always but it's usually the next generation who are really concerned and starting a business afresh with fundamental bit uh, uh, sorry sustainability fundamentally at its heart you know and those those obviously I'm attracted to but I will also say that every I'm pausing to think I think every single business that has comes in into the den now absolutely tackle sustainability and that can be in a look we're doing a little bit but we're probably not doing enough sort of way and there's an awful lot of that goes on because people want to make a difference they want to change the way they do business they don't really know what to do they don't understand the power that they've got um, through to the businesses that are absolutely we know what we're doing we are changing the way we're, we you know we're going to change the world with our businesses and then through my work with the Big Green Money Show, the whole plan with the Big Green Money Show was to try and join these sort of the huge businesses. They're hard to turn around. To the medium-sized businesses, to the small businesses, to the consumer, and try and join the dots. Because what I hear a lot is a consumer over here saying, I really, really care about this. It really matters to me. But they, that's the big businesses, they're not doing it. And there's, what can I do? What, what difference can I make? And then I hear from the big businesses saying, we really, really want to change what we're doing, but we're quite scared of the consumer because every time we talk about what we're doing, we kind of get this, this green hushing thing going on. So they're scared to stick their head above the parapet because they're not quite sure the consumer is ready. And I stand in the middle, I say, well, they are. And if you're not recognizing that, then you are in trouble already. Because I, 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 I love people. And I talk to a lot of people. And I know when people, you know, we get to the end of a Big Green Money show. I was just saying this earlier. We get to the end of an interview. And do you know the first thing I say? I believed them. Or I didn't believe them. You know, we've all got a nose for it. We know when people are just spouting stuff, you know. And then sometimes I'll meet people, you know, of big industries who so want to change, but they are worried. And green, green hushing is a real thing. But I say to anybody who's running a business, however big, however small, don't be scared of it. The consumer is readier than you think. The consumer knows way more than they have ever known before. They are certainly not going to stand for greenwash. You know, they are full of questions. They want you to be honest. And honest, no business is perfect. No business will ever be perfect. We have big impact on the planet. Every single thing we do, every light we switch on, every microphone we turn on, every chair we make, it has an impact on the planet. Don't pretend we don't. But businesses that are seen to try, and we'll talk about what they're trying, it, those are the businesses that, that even... Well, I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story. When we first started the Big Green Money Show, we could hardly, we found it really hard to convince people to come on. People saw me on Dragon's Den, they thought, oh no, this isn't going to be easy. Um, and I so admire the big business. We had the boss of Centrica, the boss of Aviva Investments on, the boss of EasyJet. He didn't have an easy time, you know. So, so, uh, but they came on because I assured them, we're not, this isn't about beating you overhead. This is joining consumers with the, you know, the big organizations and all the SME, the medium-sized business, small businesses in between. And you know what happened when we did those interviews? It, was, it, it surprised those interviewees that actually the consumers understood. They got it. They were embracing it. They were, they were delighted about the work that was being done. Because what the inter what they were what, what boss of Centrica was expecting was then going yeah you might be doing that but you're not doing this are you because that's where the consumer was for a while the consumer was if you're not perfect then I'm not listening but we're more sophisticated than that now we know so much more spoke to the boss of Aviva Mark Versey blown away by him absolutely totally committed the question that I ask and I always feel like I get under the skin of it have you got children yes are you worried for them and it's that response it's interesting Richard you talked about your children it is that response when I know whether they mean it or they don't 
And Richard is so right. We've got organizations, huge, medium, small. They want to do the right, right thing. And the consumer, we've got a perfect scenario, the consumer has woken up to their power and they're certainly waking up to their power. They know the questions to ask, they're prepared to answer them. But pensions are a funny thing. And I think it's, and this is, what, this is why this is so important. Pensions are a funny thing because they deal with something we really don't want to talk about when we're young. We're never going to grow old. We're never really going to, you know, our pension, you put your money in and you go away and you leave it. And it was very interesting when Mark said to me, I said, what's your biggest worry? He said, people don't ask enough about their pensions. They put their money in and they leave it and, and that is that. And obviously I couldn't leave it there because I then said, and what are you doing to make sure people are engaged with their pensions? Because there is a big piece of work that needs to be done there. Organisations, so the individuals who have got their pensions, they, we must ask the questions. We must understand where our money's going. And we must push further than saying it's in a, in a sustainable pension pot. Because I want to know, what does sustainable mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? Completely different things. So I want to know when you tell me my pension is ethical and sustainable. I actually want to know what it's invested in. You know, the things that you talked about, the exciting things, the things you think, yeah, I did that. I made a, I made a real, real difference. So those are the people, who, those are all of us who've got pensions. And you've got the businesses who have a responsibility to talk about their pensions. And I'm sorry, businesses are very guilty of thinking, oh, we've just got loads of stuff going on at the moment. It's, you know, we can't really deal with it. But of course we must deal with it. We must be talking about it. We must be, when I talk about businesses, about do you offer your employees sustainable pensions? It's like, well, you know, we've got them. It's not good enough. They've got to come off the page. They're going to come off the website. They've got to be actually in the conversation. They've got to get people engaged. And when you talk about this big businesses about their pensions, and it, this drives me mad, they'll say, yeah, but we're doing some amazing stuff. And I'm going, how do I know? How do those people who are putting their money with you, how do they know? Get it off the page and talk about it. Bring it to life. Make it part of everyday conversation. Make it exciting. Because if, if you're just going to put your money in, you're going to wait till you're 65 and then you take your money out and that's it. That is actually quite dull. But if you do the thing that Rich has been talking about and think, I'm actually driving change here. I'm making the difference. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I, 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 something I'm really interested in. Pick something that you really care about and make sure that's where your money's going. And that's how pensions get really really fascinating and more than that in a world when we kind of all feel what can we do boy it makes you feel powerful when you think do you know what i can do that that's what i can do so there you go you know that's pensions are pensions are fun and i didn't even know that till i into well till we talked you know till i till i looked at the make my money matter website you know and i thought wow it's full of amazing stuff so, um, so that's, bring it alive. You know, it's, it's, wait, <laughs> should I shut up now? Oh my gosh, I am <laughs> loving this because I... Uh, I in a minute, somebody's going to go, she's <laughs> gone on too long. <laughs> I'll be quiet. I, I, I think that's pretty perfect. And actually, I am dying to ask a question of this room right now. Because, you know, I made a pretty gutsy claim, right? I had a level of confidence that people in this room were going to get fired up about their agency and their power and they were going to be excited about what pensions have the power to do. So I want to ask, who still needs to be convinced? And this is because I want to know where to go in the Q&A, and I want to know who I need to find afterwards to have a little one-to-one -one conversation with. Who still needs to be convinced? Different, different question, who dares to admit to still needing convincing? How, yeah, I'll tell you what, why don't we, uh, another, another way to ask it, so people who still need to be convinced can hide. Let's see, how many people are feeling fired up about their power to use their pension as a force for good? Let's see your hands up with the people that are feeling it. Okay, okay, okay. I see a few people. Can I say this reminds me. Oh no! What does <laughs> it remind you of? My, my favorite moment of the Make Poverty of the Live Aid campaign was that a lot of media people were asked to come with a check to advertise Live Aid and Make Poverty History. And at the end, Bob Geldof said, "Hands up, anyone who doesn't want to double the amount." <laughs> that they've got in their envelope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna... <laughs>
<laughs> and literally nobody did, so I was feeling it's a bit like Okay, that well, I'm, I'm hoping that wasn't as significant as an ask yeah. as that one. But I would say, if you still need to be convinced, think about the questions that you need to ask to get over that line, okay? And make sure you bring it into the Q&A. Now, I am going to come and sit in the middle. I wouldn't want to sit right between the two of you while you were both talking, um, because... I wanted to be able to focus and kind of get ready to pace between you. But I am going to sit right here because I get the chance now to ask the first question. But I am only going to ask one question to each of you, rather than how we had originally said we would have a few questions, because I want to go right out to this audience already. I can feel, I can feel there's some questions brewing here. Um, but I'm going, to start with, I'm going to start with you, Richard, if that's okay. Because, you know, during the pandemic, I know I was trying to figure out how to make sourdough bread, whereas you started a campaign on green finance. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like why, why you did that and what you feel Make My Money Matter has achieved, but also really importantly, where do you see Make My Money Matter going next? It's been such a surprising campaign. Sorry, it's been such a surprising campaign because I really did think when we started it was just going to be about telling the public about it and that it was going to be adversarial with the pension companies and they were going to be resisting, resistant to it. Whereas actually the great sort of excitement about it has been that the pension companies were waiting for this to happen and actually quite eager, but it just needed acceleration. You know, it just needed the doors to be open and that's why so much of this money, the 1.3 trillion has happened. There's still a lot more to go, but uh, I mean, I think, I just think the way that we try to change the world is changing. And I do think the climate thing, the climate thing, uh, I, I apologize, but I, I'm, because I just came from the other side of it. And I now think about the climate crisis as a war that is going on now. And you're seeing, as it were, with every tragedy that happens, every flood, every fire, you're seeing, as it were, where the battle's being fought. And I suddenly thought, none of us, just like, you know, with all the images of the Queen during the war in the UK, you are not allowed on the climate issue to say, I'll let that one lie, I'm doing good stuff elsewhere. You know, no one in the UK was allowed during the war to say, well, actually, I'm going to disengage from that issue. It's got nothing to do with me. And I do think that, and so this was the thing that I found that was most useful for me on climate. And I do think there is a, we're in a strange situation where I kind of think, you know, that people in business, people in finance, are the necessary heroes now. They don't look like they're the heroes. They look like they should be the bad guys, but they're not. You know, everybody who runs a company has got to think, wow, I've suddenly, didn't think that was the reason I was doing it, but it turns out that is the reason. And, and just very quickly, what we're hoping to do, and I think all of you will be thinking, I mean, we did actually pick pensions rather than saying pension is the only thing. So in the future, we are starting to think a lot about banks, you should, maybe you all know, there are much better banks and much worse banks in your high street. And I think that's a huge issue. And when I was in the States, there were lots of ads saying if your bank supports cigarettes, so do you. So I think the banks is interesting. Deforestation uh, is another interesting thing. And actually the global nature of this, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see, I was inspired by, uh, there's a, it's called My Future Super, which is a superannuation is what the Australians call pensions. And that's been a very interesting new pension company that's only based on this in theory. And I'm really interested in how pension companies now start to actually use this as a marketing tool. So I'm interested in global, interested in forests, interested in banks. That's, that's the future. But we've got to sort out the rest of the pensions too. Yeah, well, that's sort of a, a pretty good list of things to be focusing on the way forward. And I just want to reflect, br reflect briefly on your framing of, of, of wartime mentality on some of this. And actually, the question that I ask myself and I encourage other people to think about and answer for themselves is we are in a moment that really matters in history. And we are going to have to choose what side of history we want to be on. That is an active choice that we all get a chance to make right now. 
And so I just would encourage you all to be thinking about that as you think about the power and the agency you have. I also, as you know, really believe accountants will save the world. I have a t-shirt, it's Peter Backer, it's not my quote, but I also was saying that I wanna get t-shirts that say pensions will save the world. But then I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't stop there because you know lawyers are gonna save the world and designers are gonna save the world and artists are gonna save the world. And I think that just goes to show we all have to figure out no matter what we do and where we do, even in Karen's question of like what we would do in a dream world, we all have the power to be a part of the change that needs to happen. So let's go make those t-shirts for whatever industry you are and find the people in your organizations to work alongside. Yeah. Um, oh. I, I know, I just agree so much. I mean, when I started Comic Relief, it seemed odd that comedians should do a lot of fundraising on the issue of poverty because that didn't seem to be their power base and we found a way to make that effective. And I do think that everyone, no matter what you do, it doesn't take much work for you to think, oh, wait a minute, there's something I can do here and be that changing your pension or looking at your supply chains or whatever way you want to change things. I think all of us, all of our work is relevant to the environmental issues. Yeah. Totally. So, Deborah, I want to kind of turn back to you over here. Ooh, it's actually a turning chair. This is good. This makes it easier. I can just turn towards you. So, Deborah, you are a hugely respected voice in business, and you've talked about some of the conversations you've had with some business leaders, and you know that you spend a lot of time working with all sorts of people across all different levels within companies. You also talked about this definition of sustainability, that, you know, how many, how many different definitions are there? You know, what is the infinity loop of the sustainability definitions? But I wondered if you could reflect a little bit on how those people who have these roles in businesses can prioritize all the different things that they are expected to do in sustainability, all the challenges, all the things that are coming across their desk. And I think I might know the answer to this based on what you said earlier, but just to be super clear, where you think how they consider their pensions should be on that list. Um, well, first of all, a, a really common thread when I talk to businesses um, in terms of sustainability is that they would, they'd like a level playing field because, you know, what, what actually is a sustainable mean? And that gets sustainability a really bad name. That's how greenwashing happens. You know, it's, I've got a, we use renewable energy to power up our cars, you know. That makes us sustainable? I don't know. So I think, I think there is a little bit of work that needs to come in, and I think we're ready for it. I think it's going to happen quite soon, but I think the framework, what actually is sustainability and what claim can I make? In the meantime, I think businesses need to be transparent about what they mean by sustainability. So in the absence of a framework, you know, I should really be able to, really, really easily be able to click through a website or, you know, look at any of the papers that you put out and be able to say, oh, I get it. I know what, I know what's important to you. Um, in terms of priority, I, I, and this is absolutely true, until I had the conversation with Richard about Make My Money Matter, I've got to tell you, pensions were not high. Um, because they, you know, I was doing the same as I'm talking about, which is, yeah, 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 pensions, whatever. Anyway, over here. And from, since that conversation, since I've understand the power of the pension, I think it's right up there. Yeah. Um, and not just, not just we offer sustainable pensions, green pensions, whatever you want to call it. What does that mean? What can you do with that pension? Why does it make a difference? So, so I genuinely, you know, I, I suspect I wouldn't have been invited here today if I didn't believe that. <laughs> but I genuinely believe that, 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 that in the power of pensions. Actually, um, I was at COP and I was talking at COP and I did say, people were saying, oh, a corporation's going to do anything. Is anything really going to change? And I said, you know what? They, they change either because they really, really care or they change for commercial reasons and you follow your money. And if I was investing long-term money now, pension money is long-term money. If you're investing long-term money, why would you invest in something that you fundamentally know is going, in 25 years' time, is going to be off the agenda? Why would you do that? You know, so as new, you know, just commercially, you don't care about the planet at all, it makes good business sense. And that's the bit of magic that says, it kind of, to me, it doesn't matter what your reasoning is. I prefer it is because you care about the planet. But if the end result is that we end up with sustainable pensions, I'm happy with that. All right. I think we are probably all happy with that. And I think that's why we're all here. And your comments, Deborah, they remind me of uh, at B Lab UK, 
Um, we spend a lot of time talking about systems change, and systems change is something that's in the air, and obviously pension funds have a critical role to play in driving systems change. And you, when you break it down, really, what systems change, and this is not me, this is B-Lab UK speaking, but it's about regulatory change, and it's about culture change. And I would say one of the beautiful golden threads from this conversation tonight has really been about why and how it is so important for yes to us to make sure we have a level playing field, but to recognize culture is what can really drive this forward. And again, every single one of you in this room has a role to play in shaping and, and moving that culture forward. So I want to turn it to you in the room. We have about 10 minutes, 10.15 if Hasinta gives me an extra five. Um, but let me see if we've got some questions in the audience. Oh, one already. Now, can I ask you, when you introduce your name, could you also say if you've got a song that is like coming to your mind? Just, <laughs> we're going to have to write up this playlist. So I'm going to have to call on. So, OK, so funnily enough, when you asked what my job would be, all jobs paying, I said I wanted to be an Annie Lennox impersonator. There we go. <laughs> That's a, pr that's a pretty, yeah. Anyway, this is too spooky, because I'm obsessed by child because I feel, not only does she have the voice, but also the face of Joni Mitchell. <laughs> so I, can I just suggest that you two together, Annie and... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll Problem is, I can't, sing at, yeah. I can't sing at all, so... I can't either, but that'll be an awesome collab, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm a, a pensions journalist, and I write a lot about sustainable investment, and... I could probably talk for half an hour, so I'm going to really try not to. But I just wanted to pick up on something that Deborah said about the fact that sustainability in a business is really badly defined. And sustainable investment is also really badly defined. And that's because it's a huge universe. And I think the best way to think of it is a bridge between traditional investment and philanthropy. And there are like steps along that bridge. Um, so I, one of my questions to you is, I'm going to have two questions, sorry. That's, um, one of my questions to you is, how do we make sure that we communicate all of the complexity of sustainable investment without turning people off and making them feel like, oh, I don't trust you, you're just a greenwasher. And I know the financial services industry really well, and let me tell you, they are not the creative industries. They are really bad at comms and really bad at communicating with the end user. And the second question is, sorry, is that I agree with you that we can shape our pensions, but there are big forces in the pensions field that we need to be aware of. So I'm going to assume that most people here, for argument's sake, is in the private sector, and most of them have an auto enrolled pension scheme. Those pension schemes are driven by cost, and that means that we have a lot of passive equity in it, and that means that when it comes to shaping sustainable investing, it's all about engagement and changing companies, because you're invested in big companies. And that is really hard and really resource intensive to do. And we've had some success in terms of persuading things like BP to adopt net zero targets, but there's a long way to go. So how do we help people to understand that and shape the debate? Okay, so two, two questions and maybe one, one each. Maybe Deborah on the communication piece to that question, which was I think the upfront one. And then the how, how do we shape some of this, Richard? Maybe we can come to you with that. But do you want to start, Deborah? Well, yes. I mean, I don't actually work with, uh, I don't really understand my way around the financial service industry. So I'm going to say stuff that, that, that everybody's going to shout, you can't possibly do that. I always think, why can't you possibly do that? Because the, <laughs> the best way to communicate is simply and clearly. And the point about simple is if anybody has read any of their pension documents, they will have fallen asleep halfway through them because they are dull as ditch water. They've got far too many words. They take way too long to get to the point. And, and, and there are, you know, listen, we, we are good at communicating, but I don't understand how that good communication gets drowned out by you know, too many words. Um, so for me, it really is quite simple. You make it upfront, you make it clear, and you allow people to drill into it if they want to. But most of the message we talk about, they're not that complicated. They're really quite simple. If you want more, then you should be able to ask for more. But at a very, very entry level, I want to be able to know this is what I, wa this is what I want to do, that's what my money is going to be doing, and then I want the option to say actually exactly what does that mean. But our language, I don't know whether it's a legacy thing, but we do tend to use really complex 
languages, particularly in the financial services. And, and, and you know, I'm sure there's a load of people thinking, well, we have to, because of course there are regulations, so they're blinking well should be. But it doesn't mean to say everything has to be incredibly heavy-handed. And that is half of the problem of pensions just feeling dull, particularly for a younger generation who has much more exciting conversation than the way we present pensions. What a great, great answer to the question. I might just change my idea of what job I would have. Wouldn't it be cool to be like a pension translator? Like how you could mm -hmm. read it and then like figure out, okay, that 60 pages is actually just saying this three lines. Interesting job, maybe. Um, Richard. No, I all I would say is, you know, I'm definitely not an expert. And it's very interesting that you haven't really investigated it, say there's complexity at every point of this discussion. And I remember when I first talked to people about this, they said it is very complicated, but it is also a direction, you know, of direction of travel. And it will get clearer what constitutes you know, the right kind of sustainability and that which is a little bit casual. And I think that people will get more confident in terms of the pension providers to actually make the distinctions. And one of the things that I say to people is that, you know, the point of your financial officer your, and the company you're working for is they're meant to think about it and work at it. And every single pension company who we're talking to and all the businesses we're talking to about net zero, they now have to apply their full intellectual and transparent rigor to these issues. So I suppose all I would say as someone who doesn't know much is that the doubt about it should not be a reason for not pressing for it because you are putting pressure on the various people in the financial food chain to get clearer, to make it clearer to them. And there will be, as it were, stumbling points where people say, well, I still do want to invest in something you wouldn't agree with. And if you don't agree with that, then get a different kind of pension. So there will be, as it were, fallout. But the doubt about the accuracy is not a reason not to fully engage and not to get the public to ask for what they want. I suppose that's all I'd say. And now I know you want to come in again, Deborah, which is fine. But maybe I can just ask if there's other questions, we could get the microphone to you while, Deborah, you want to come in with a last comment. Yeah, the other thing that um, I, I, this is all about trust. This is all about, you know, if somebody tells you that your pension is sustainable, that you trust it. There can be over claims, and, and to, I'm really passionate about this. All of the businesses I work with, we do a, this is where we want to go. This is where we are on that journey. And I think it's sometimes as important to talk about the things that you're not promising as the things that you are promising, because that builds trust. So if, if, if you look at something that is amazing and glowing and brilliant, it's going to solve all the problems of the world. I'm, I'm a bit like, mm, I'm not sure about that. Um, but if somebody says to me, this is where we are going, and again, when I go back to Aviva Investors, you know, they know they haven't finished their journey, but they need to talk about clearly there is what, not, not just are we going to be, you know, we're not going to be in fossil fuels by 2030, whatever it is that they're going to claim, but actually where we are on that journey. Because my next question when they say they're not going to be in fossil fuels by 2030 is, yeah, but where are you now? And what are the steps along the way? Because it isn't the day before the day you're supposed to be out of fossil fuels, you suddenly get out of fossil fuels. I want to know how that journey is. So I think communications should engage people longer term, not just a snapshot, and then I can go away and I can get on with my life. Come back to me, because we're, we're on this journey. We'll tell you where we are, you know, and, and you can be part of that. So I think that's how you keep it alive, and it doesn't just become this, oh, okay, that's fine, by 2030 they'll be doing that. Love, love the vibe. I know we've got time probably for one last question, so start with your playlist song, if you wouldn't mind. Oh. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm from the Financial Times' charity, which is called Flick, the Financial Literacy and Inclusion Campaign. So we've heard a lot about businesses today, but in terms of schools, thinking back to the red nose, what is the equivalent that we can do in schools? How can we make people that perhaps aren't like your kids, that are suffering from cost of living stuff, who don't even know what a pension is, how can we make them care about this like now in schools? And starting with, on the comms point, can we, can we look at changing the word pension to future fund or something? Because I know my 16-year-old cousin has no idea what a pension is. So, so what can we do now? Oh, I love it. Why? It's the whys, right? Like, why not? Why not? Um, did you have a song? Uh, I, I need a dollar. I 
<laughs> okay, I like it. Yeah. It's going on the playlist. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard. I mean, by, the, by the way, that's such an interesting question. I haven't thought about it at all. I mean, I, I am deeply puzzled by our, how our education system still does not seem to be addressing the world of jobs and justice and the environment. The fact that anyone still teaches Latin is so completely bizarre. So I think these are really interesting questions. And I do think that the young, you know, what I can see of my kids is they know where their money's going and their relationship to, to Monzo and how much they're meant to spend during the course of a week and how much they've spent and overspent. I really think that schools taking responsibility for talking about money and also making people realize that that the money isn't this great big monster over there, that every time you make a purchase, if you shop at the co-op, you're making some kind of a commitment. If you buy Tom's shoes, if you, I mean, I think all of these things are really interesting. And if, if you guys are thinking about that, then that's great because money was entirely ignored during my education. And then when I was in my 30s, money with regard to change in the world was entirely about charity. And I think that there's a big, you know, shift going on there. That's such an interesting issue to raise. And you're absolutely right. Pension's such a peculiar word. I mean, that, yeah. We should take that one forward. I'm going to hold that, actually, as my, my thought I think I'm going to wander home tonight thinking about is what could you rebrand pensions to be? I love Future Fund. Um, I, we are at time, but, Deborah, I can feel that maybe you want to come in on that question or maybe provide some No, I wish I'd said that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, for me, the thing is it's, it, it is actually about money because I suspect that in most of our children's lifetimes, money is going to change form many, many times. It already is. So for me, the, the, you know, the single biggest issue is that understanding of what actually is money. You know, what does it do? What are you supposed to do with it? Because it, we all think of money as, well, maybe not anymore because we all use contactless. But, you know, was, to me, I still see the pound notes and the coins. And that is going to change. So it's the fundaments of money. You're, you're so right. You know, we need to grow up with that. It needs to be embedded in the same way that they're now way more computer literate than I'm ever going to be because they grow up with it. And we've got to get that absolutely onto the school school curriculum at now and when kids are young so that it isn't this oh what's all that about you know they grow up with it I love that question I love your name you're absolutely right we should promise ourselves that if we ne come all together again we have a new name for pensions oh what a good challenge maybe we could even start a little like hashtag and do that virtually oh, Twitter Twitter hashtag coming um, friends we are over our hour I'm still curious if there's anyone who would not put their hand up to say that they are super excited about the power of pensions so it is my job actually to thank our incredible speakers, to thank the organizations that have hosted us here tonight, as well as to thank The Conduit as being just the most perfect venue. And Karen, maybe I can turn it over to you to send us on our way. Um, and I need to thank you, Shah, for doing a tremendous job this evening. Thank, thank you to all of our, our panel tonight. And to you, our audience, as always, um, the, the tradition of The Conduit is we don't want the conversation to stop. Um, tonight, as I said earlier, join us um, at the bar at the back for a glass of red or white wine, or rumour has it we might even have a beer. And while you're having a drink, here is my challenge to you. What can you, the conduit members and guests, do together? After tonight, not as individuals, but as a collaborative. Where can we take this conversation within the club? You know, when do we regroup? When do we use our contacts, our black books, and say, Richard, how can we help? Deborah, what do you think of this as an idea? So, once again, I'd like to thank our lovely panel, and to you, please join us and enjoy the rest of your evening.